It's my distinct honor to introduce you to the recipient of the 2020 AC Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Sybil Seitzinger. This award honors major long-term achievements in the aquatic sciences, including research, education, and service to the scientific community and society. Sybil is the Executive Director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions and a professor in the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria, Canada. Sybil is receiving this award in recognition of her critical research on the nutrient biogeochemistry of coastal and freshwater ecosystems spanning from molecular organic chemical characterization to global scale models and the application of new knowledge. Dr. Seitzinger's research has provided the cornerstone of much of what we know about nutrient biogeochemistry in aquatic systems. With studies spanning molecular to global scales, her many papers are well cited and a testament to the impact of her research. Her contributions include watershed syntheses, cutting edge regional and global analyses, and the development of methods that have opened new fields of study. As an example, Dr. Seitzinger demonstrated that dissolved organic nitrogen, previously overlooked, was bioavailable and therefore needed to be accounted for in nutrient reduction strategies to curb eutrophication. In addition to her work on nitrogen cycling, Sybil has made influential contributions to our understanding of rivers, estuaries, and nutrient cycling in general. One of these contributions was realized through her leadership of the Global Nutrient Export from Watersheds Project, which has been used to explore scenarios for water resource management and to extend our knowledge of nutrient dynamics in many rivers worldwide. Dr. Seitzinger is a distinguished scholar and leader in the global scientific community. As executive director of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, she helped facilitate and integrate the work of scientists from 77 countries on global environmental change issues. She continues working along this path with the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. She's an elected member of the American Academies of Arts and Sciences, elected fellow of AGU, and served as president of ASLO, which is also an elected position. Um, Sybil's colleagues note that she works tirelessly to guide society onto a sustainable pathway during our current era of rapid global change. ASLO President Mike Pace reflected on this award recognition, saying Sybil Seitzinger has throughout her career continually deepened and broadened her scientific perspective to make progress on key problems in research and in the application of research to pressing environmental issues. Her work is a testament to how scientists can both make great advances and have great impacts. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Sybil Seitzinger for receiving ASLO's Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, I'm very honored to receive this ASLO award, and in particular, an award named after A.C. Redfield. Um, when Mike called me to tell me that I was going to receive this award, it really gave me a chance to pause and reflect back over um, a few decades of, of career, and also to remember how fundamental Redfield's work was to starting me on my path throughout my research career. And I'll come back to that in a few moments. But I want to first start out by thanking my guiding lights, those so many people that have supported me and encouraged me and done much of the heavy lifting throughout my career and for much of the work that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes from now. So thank you, thank you all. And I can only list some of them here, so there's many more. Um, so my approach, when I think back on it, has always been that I've been interested in global environmental problems. And I've approached that by uh, site-specific measurements um, that have been then combined into synthesis and models in, with much collaboration with others that we've then used to scale up to get a global picture of the issue, hopefully informing solutions along the way. And I guess I'm noted for sort of three areas most of, of my research, which I list here. And I'm only going to focus on the first two today. 
My work really started out with denitrification, and it really started with work that was being done by my advisor, Scott Nixon, who was making some of the first measurements of sediment water nutrient fluxes in estuaries. And one of the things that became apparent was that the N to P ratio in those effluxes was markedly less than would be predicted from the Redfield ratio. Um, so the question became, where is this missing nitrogen? And as a beginning graduate student, I thought, hmm, could it be denitrification? Denitrification is the reduction by microbes of nitrate or nitrite to basically nitrogen gas, which is inert, diffuses out of the system. So it's a true sink for nitrogen in a system. But little was known about denitrification and where it was occurring, um, although sediments seemed like they would be an ideal site for that. So it launched me into measurements um, across a range of systems, which I'll go into. But it also, at the same time, we were beginning to see and realize that there were large amounts of anthropogenically fixed nitrogen that were entering terrestrial systems around the world. And the question was, where is the, what is the fate of that nitrogen? Is it being all removed on the landscape, or is a large portion of it getting into our waters and causing eutrophication problems? Or, possibly, was a lot of the nitrogen getting removed by denitrification along that aquatic continuum? So that started an international working group that I led, um, which was to develop global models of the magnitude and sources of nutrient inputs to watersheds, and how much of that nu those nutrients are getting into rivers and being then transported potentially to estuaries and downstream coastal and offshore ecosystems. And again, we started with site-specific measurements that we used to scale up. Um, through various modeling approaches to get a global perspective. The um, spatial resolution of the model was a half a degree um, and included watersheds around the world. There were inputs, databases of nutrient sources in each of these watersheds, um, both natural and anthropogenic, from both non-point and point sources. And then the nutrients were moved off of the landscape into the rivers through various hydrological and physical factors. And with, once within the river system, there were removal processes, including denitrification for nitrogen. And then the overall output of the model was nutrient export at the mouth of the rivers as they entered into the coastal zone. So I'll go back and now and talk a little bit about denitrification and denitrification in those rivers and how we came up with those, with, um, that estimates, those estimates globally. Um, we pulled together data from the literature as well as some of our own measurements and saw that the percent of nitrogen input to rivers and to lakes and reservoirs could be described as a function of the water depth and basically the residence time of the water in the river reaches or in the lake itself. So we took the new nitrogen inputs to all of these rivers um, and lakes and estimated using this approach the total amount of denitrification globally in lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. And before I comment on those numbers, you'll see that of the 250 teragrams of nitrogen coming into terrestrial environments, we saw that only about 126 were getting into the freshwater environment. So um, the, the rest of it was being removed on the landscape. My colleague Lex Bauman has shown that a lot of denitrification is occurring there. But in the lakes and reservoirs, our estimates were that about 31 teragrams of nitrogen were being denitrified, and in rivers, another 38. This modeling approach also gave us the first spatially explicit global view of dissolved inorganic nitrogen export around the world by rivers from watersheds. And it showed, of course, as we might expect in Western Europe, the high um, nutrient export and in parts of the Eastern US. Our estimates for the Mississippi have always been a little bit low. Um, but the thing that really stood out that we hadn't known before was this hot spot in Southern and Eastern Asia. This work also allowed us to interrogate where, what were the sources of inorganic nitrogen that were driving the river export. And for DIN, it was primarily agricultural sources at the global scale. And while lots of um, watersheds were still dominated by natural nitrogen fixation, the anthropogenically dominated watersheds, the single largest source was based usually from agricultural sources. 
But this contrasted markedly from the DIP export, which was basically over half from um, point sources and quite consistently in anthropogenically dominated um, watersheds was point sources. So this gave us some insight into differences in management approaches that should be taken if you're going to control the nitrogen versus the phosphorus in organic forms. We also use this model with um, an integrated assessment models to develop input databases where we could look at various future scenarios. And this just shows um, one example in which, and I'm just showing sort of Africa, Asia, and Europe here, um, that with very aggressive nitrogen management on the landscape, we, it, we potentially could dramatically um, moderate the increase in DIN export over this 20, 2000 to 2030. 30 year period compared to a business as usual scenario, and especially in that hot spot in southern and eastern Asia. Well, let's go back now to denitrification in estuaries where we started from. And we um, made measurements over annual cycles in a number of estuaries, as well as used data from many other people's measurements, and saw that there was a relationship at the annual scale of the, um, that denitrification rates were increasing as the nitrogen loading rates increased. We also then looked at it in a slightly different way and saw that the percent of the nitrogen inputs to estuaries was um, a function of the water depth and the water residence time. And actually it was a very similar relationship that we had seen with rivers and lakes. So this relationship was then used in our global model to estimate um, denitrification in estuaries globally. About eight teragrams of nitrogen. And at first this was a little disappointing because I'd spent a lot of time measuring denitrification in estuaries and the number was fairly small. Um, but over time we looked at it more and, and looked into it more and, and realizing that a lot of the nitrogen that is transported by rivers doesn't go through estuaries. It's these large rivers discharging directly to our continental shelves. And work by Katja Fennell and her colleagues recently have really advanced this understanding a lot. And we've used that now to refine our estimates of the denitrification of land-based nitrogen, okay, um, that is being lost in the coastal margins, ocean margins and continental shelves, basically. Um, so there's additional denitrification going on in shelves that is driven by the onwelling of nitrogen from the open ocean. So this is just the amount of denitrification associated with this land-derived nitrogen. So now we can add up all these numbers, and um, we come up with about 110 teragrams, which is fairly consistent with the amount coming into the rivers originally at a global scale. Um, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in these numbers, um, but we, I think we can say that we have a general idea now of where the nitrogen is being removed along the aquatic continuum. And all of this came from discontinuities or in, inconsistencies in the redfield ratio in one estuary. Um, so quite a remarkable um, uh, beginning with Redfield. Well, about 10 years ago, um, I started to think that I really wanted to see if I couldn't have a bigger impact than I was having with my own research group and collaborators. And at, at that time, I, I, was, I was basically about at that time I was ASLO president, and it really sowed the seed of wanting to um, step up to a different level and have an impact beyond what I could do myself with my group. And so in about 10 years ago, so this is my second lifetime that I'm going to be talking about, um, I became the executive director of IGBP, which was a, um, a network of thousands of scientists around the world studying global environmental change. And you can see a number of the projects um, that we had that some of you I think may have been or involved in now even. And this was a very um, rewarding experience. I was um, uh, one, of the, one of my responsibilities was to report to um, national agencies around the world on some of the research coming out of these projects. 
and also working at the UN level, reporting regularly to the UNFCCC on some of the most recent advances relevant to climate change that were coming out of these projects. Well, it was very rewarding, it was challenging. Um, after seven years, though, I felt like I really was ready to move back to a bit smaller scale, where I could see the results of the efforts being used to really develop solutions. And so moving more from the problem identification side to really the solution side, and also one that would really focus on climate change solutions. So four years ago, I became the director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, PICS. And um, PICS is, at, at PICS, I um, de define or determine the direction of the institute, but also the projects that we fund on mitigation and adaptation. And the model that we've used is one in which of co-design. So we combine solution seekers government from government at all levels. Um, it could be the private sector, certainly as well, um, NGOs, um, with researchers from across the four major research universities in British Columbia. And together, they co-identify problems that need research done. They write the proposals together. Um, and they work together throughout the project to move forward knowledge on both mitigation and adaptation. We are funding a wide range of projects now, as you can see some of the, the topics, overall topics that we're addressing. Um, it's very exciting to be involved with these transdisciplinary teams as they work together. And it's an experiment, um, but it seems to be working. So we're very excited about that. So in closing, I'd just like to make two remarks. Um, one is that for those of you in the audience who would like to um, take on some leadership responsibilities that go beyond what you're doing in your current research programs, um, I just encourage you to look for those opportunities and look for ones that speak to you and give it a try. Um, and second of all, on a little bit more somber note, um, of course, we're all very aware that climate change is all too real. And <clears throat> it's becoming more and more apparent that all societies and all ecosystems are going to be affected by climate change in generations to come. It's exciting to see at this meeting all the sessions that are addressing climate change in one way or another. And I encourage those of you who are working on those areas to keep doing that and bring your expertise to that issue. And for those of you who have not yet engaged in climate change research and solutions in particular, I encourage you to look and see where what you know and your knowledge and expertise can come to bear on this greatest challenge that we're facing, um, climate change. So thank you. <laughs>